on the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God, coming to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. As you know, our God is the sovereign ruler of the universe, and he is in control. He has everything under control. He possesses the highest power and the greatest authority in the universe without being in control, and without being controlled, I should say. He has the power, absolute sovereignty, and it all belongs to the Lord our God alone. And so we need to remember that as we look at what's happening in our world. There's a lot going on in our country. And uh, I really feel like it's almost a, a blanket that has been laid upon... I don't know what just happened, but uh, I'll say that over again. I really felt like there's a blanket of discouragement that's resting on a lot of God's people. But I got a word for you tonight. Amen. We don't have to be discouraged. We're in control because our God is in control. I want you to just hold that place in Chronicles. I just felt to go to Isaiah for a moment. Come on with me to Isaiah chapter 60. Uh, I have almost totally stopped looking at the news. Every time I turn it on, I get so grieved in my spirit that I'm just not. We used to watch it every night. Now we turn it on, I turn it off again because it's just so undesirable, just so unappetizing to see what's going on. But I want you to look at two promises in Isaiah. Come with me to chapter 60, verses 1 and 3. It tells us what's going on. It's a picture of what's going on in our nation right now. But I want to tell you that our hope is in the Lord. And just remember this, God hasn't spoken yet. Everybody else is talking, but God has not spoken yet. And when he speaks, things will come into order. But look at these verses, and these are familiar to you in Isaiah 60, at verse 1 through 3. Arise and what? Shine for thy light, the revelation of truth is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy coming. That's a word, a sure word. I want you to turn over to chapter 62, uh, and look at this with me as well. Verse 61, chapter 61, Isaiah 61. Uh, and this is the fulfillment of what he said was going to happen. It's happening. The Holy Spirit is in the land. In Isaiah 61, verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Not going to be, it's here. The glory of God is upon you because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenheartest, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. You know what that means? The Amplified Translation says that it would be the year of his favor. I love that that this is the year of his favor uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, in the church, among the redeemed, to give unto them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now come on back with me again to Chronicles chapter 29. I'm going to be reading some verses from there. But uh, as I come to the pulpit tonight, I'm talking to you about God. We're going to focus in on the Lord. You remember when I came back from uh, two months of being out of the pulpit in July and August, that the Lord said to me when I came back, he said, tell my people about me. Talk to them about me. Uh, and then he drew my attention to Psalm 50 verse 21. It says, for they think that I'm just like them. Uh, God is not like us. We were made in his image and in his likeness. He's not like us. We are to be like him. And God made that statement to me. He said, my people think I'm like they are, but I'm not. And I want you to talk to them about me. So we're talking tonight about the sovereignty of God, how great is our God. And King David had that theme here in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Come down to verse 10. Therefore, David blessed the Lord before all the congregation 
And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and forever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. Thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee. Thou reignest over all, and in thy hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great, to, to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Now, have you all got that in front of you, that passage of Scripture? I want you to read it out loud with me now. You need to let your ear hear your own voice declaring the word of God tonight. Right from verse 10, we're going to read right on down through verse 13, reading it one more time, okay? Let this sink in, gain your attention, bring your mind focused to the word tonight so that God will be able to talk to you. Are you ready? Verse 10, with me out loud. Therefore, God, David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thy hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. God is in control. When we speak about the sovereignty of God, I have Webster's Dictionary, uh, the 1828, trans uh, the, date, the first date it was published, 1828, it is... Uh, the English Dictionary, that first published by Daniel Webster, and this particular volume was given to me by Dolores and, and Richie uh, several years ago, and it's a, it's a mainstay of reference in my library. And I looked up uh, that word in Webster's Dictionary, what it meant to the colonists, what it meant to the pilgrims, what it meant to our church fathers, not what it necessarily means today, but what it meant to them in its original context. Come to find out that that word sovereign means the supreme power possessing supernatural dominion, supreme dominion. That's descriptive of God, isn't it? He holds supreme power. There is no power greater than our God. There is no power higher among the governments of the earth. The combined military forces of the nations could never match the power of our God. And Webster said, secondly, it is absolute supremacy absolutely belonging only to God. It is supreme power, absolutely belonging only to God. So when we're talking about the sovereignty of God tonight, we find that he is in control no matter what happens. We don't have to worry about a thing. He's got it all under control. When we look at the chaos that's in the nation and we listen to what this one is saying, what that spin doctor is saying, uh, we could get discouraged real easy. You, you could become fearful. If we didn't know that God is on our side and he's taking care of us, we would have a lot to worry about. We really would. But uh, I'm grateful to tell you tonight that God is absolutely in control. And that fact alone should bring you and I great comfort and peace, even as this election approaches. There's a lot of confusion in the land, a lot of discouragement, a lot of fear. And you don't know who to believe. But I believe God. And I believe in the end of the day, when Father speaks, he'll bring the whole mess to a conclusion, and we'll know who he has chosen to be the next president. So don't worry about it. Get ready to vote, but be prayerful. And keep your eyes riveted on the Lord. Keep your thoughts in heavenly places. Don't get caught up in the arguments that folks at the job may want to spin off into. Don't get caught up in that. Just so, uh-huh, mm -hmm, okay, but God. That's what I say every time I hear a poll. This poll says this, this poll says that, this poll says another thing, and this poll says something different still. I just keep saying out loud, but God, Amen. but God. Now, you and I got to get a hold of that because uh, we could get discouraged just like our neighbors are confused and discouraged. But I'm not because I know in whom I have believed, and I believe in God's going to indicate exactly 
how to move in this election. I want to tell you something. It's not about party. It's not about personalities. It's not about politics. There's one thing we have to be concerned about, and that is the issues of the day and how they affect our children and our grandchildren. I want to submit to you tonight, as I inject something into this study that I wasn't even going to use on Sunday, as I see it, there are three major issues that you and I need to be voting on. Not personality, not party, not politics, not who's the lesser or greater of the evils, but uh, because neither candidate is perfect. And both are lacking in character. But it, it, character is not the only issue, and I want you to hear this tonight. If it were just by appearance that we could make a choice, it might be one way or the other. If we were just depending on character, I don't see character in either side. There's a character flaw in both, both the candidates. But here's the issues that you and I have got to vote for as Christians. The sanctity of human life. Now I'm going to tell you pro up front, right up front, uh, not, I've got too little time left to get you ready for the election, to, to hedge on what I should or should not say. So I don't care about politics tonight. I'm not speaking politics, so please hear me. I want you to hear the truth from my heart as your pastor so you will know how to approach the election booth and what to do when you get inside there and pull that curtain behind you. You want to vote the issues. These are the things that are going to affect your children and your grandchildren starting the 9th of November and thereafter. These are the things that we have to be concerned about. The sanctity of human life. I'll tell you right up front, Trump is pro-life. Hillary is voliciously pro-abortion. Democrats have the most pro-abortion platform in history. Trump, however, is not only pro-life, but is the only presidential candidate in history to say so up front. I will appoint pro-life Supreme Court justices. This is what he has said. Surely every pro-life believer sees the urgency on this issue alone. And there are so many more clear differences between the two. So this is a major issue. Please get it clear in your mind that we are voting on the sanctity of human life. Life is important. They're estimating now 60 million babies have been aborted. And the blood of the innocent is soaking our land and it cries unto God. I remember when Cain rose up and killed Abel there in the third or fourth chapter of Genesis. And God came on the scene and he said to Cain, where is thy brother? He said, the brother, your brother's blood is crying to me from the earth. Did you know that blood has the voice? The blood speaks. Hebrew says that about the blood of Jesus, that it speaks for us. So blood has a voice. The voice of 60 million innocent babies are crying out to God. I, I saw something the other day in studying in the Revelation in the sixth chapter where it talks about the souls that are hidden underneath the throne of God and they're crying to God for vengeance. When are you going to avenge us? I believe that's where all of the aborted babies are being held and preserved and safeguarded right now under the throne of God. And he's saying to them, be still and wait until others are, fi it's all finished and then I'll give you the white robes of righteousness. But I believe that that's where uh, the babies are right now. They're under the very throne of God, under his capable keeping power and that they're safe there, safe there. So the blood of the innocent cries out, and this, in, it, this issue of the sanctity of human life has got to affect our vote. The second one, religious freedom. Oh, man, this is a biggie. Uh, did you know that the First Amendment not only guarantees you freedom of speech, but the First Amendment also guarantees us the right of assembly, that we can gather together in groups, in churches, and in families, and in homes. That First Amendment is crucial. And the second one, both of them are under serious assault. The second is the right for you to defend yourself. And uh, we need to recognize that this political campaign is very much about the Constitution and about the Bill of Rights. You know that there are 23 amendments in the Constitution. The first 10 of them make up the Bill of Rights. And that is that governmental doctrine that is so important for preserving our freedoms and our liberties. I'm so glad God is sovereign tonight because he's got us in the palm of his hand and he's safeguarding us. Amen. But we need to be wise and, and, and alert. Religious freedom. Hillary and the party she represents have zero respect for religious liberty, especially for Christians. She's come out recently expressed how she hates the Catholics. And I thought there ought to be an uprise, uproar coming out of the Catholic Church. I haven't heard much. It's amazing. 
but uh, she has no, no love for Christians and hates evangelicals. Now, you and I, even though we are Pentecostal, we would be included in that group called evangelicals. That is Bible-believing people. We read the Bible. We believe the Bible. We pray to a living God. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was virgin born, died on the cross for us, was buried, arose the third day, that in him we have life. We believe that. Those are the truths of our Christian faith. But those are the truths that are under assault right now. They want to eliminate them. If they had their way, Christians and the church would be completely removed from the public square. In contrast, Trump has promised to rescind the 1904 Jefferson Amendment, which threatens 501c3 status and attempts to silence the church from addressing moral issues and public policy, candidates, and elections. That's the, that's the law they're using to keep pastors quiet in their pulpits. You can't talk about the election. You can't talk about candidates. You can't talk about politics. That's awful. Oh, no, 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 it isn't. No, it isn't. It is a duty and responsibility of us as pastors to tell you the truth. Where are you going to hear it from? The newspaper? Not likely. Your neighbor? Not likely. You're going to have to get it from the man or woman of God who's holding out righteousness as the standard that we live by. But this law, what they passed in 1954, called the Johnson Amendment, was an outright blatant attack on the church to silence the church. And because of tax-exempt status, they have taken the pulpit away from the pastors. And they're afraid to say anything because they'll take away our tax-exempt status. So what? Really, push come to shove, so what? If they took it, it wouldn't affect anything. Because Christians don't give because of their contribution deducted from taxes. We don't tithe because of that. We don't give unto the work of the Lord and support missions because they're going to get us off our income tax. I hope that's not your motivation. Your motivation is I love the Lord, number one. Number two, I'm obedient to his word. And so uh, the government says, you know, well, even Jesus, let me say this to you about this for a moment. Jesus never criticized the Roman government. Catch this now. He never commended them, and he never attacked them, and he never talked about them. Jesus. The only thing he ever said was, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. He said, pay your taxes, and then pay your tithes. Ooh. We haven't even taken the offering yet. I just got to a point. Ooh. <laughs> render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. You would not dare to not pay your taxes. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. Render to God the things that are his. What are his? The tithe. It belongs unto the Lord. It's holy. It's to be brought into the house of the Lord every week. Well, that's the only thing Jesus ever said about Rome. He never argued with the government. He never blasted Caesar. Neither did Paul, the apostle. They never attacked the government. Pro or con. They just taught the kingdom. They preached the kingdom. So we have to be concerned when they pass laws like the Johnson Amendment to stop us. And we just say, not going to work. We're going to keep on serving the Lord. The Trump insists that Christians be involved in the public square as they have been from the beginning of the nation, openly and freely, absolutely free to speak biblically at all times and on every subject. Now, that's a big difference between the two parties right there. Here's the third issue, Supreme Court appointees. These three issues, beloved, when you go into the voting booth, please keep them in mind. Who is going to preserve the sanctity of human life? Who is going to preserve religious freedoms for my son and my daughter and my grandchildren? And third, who is going to be appointed to the Supreme Court? This is so important. It is likely the next president will appoint at least two and possibly as many as five Supreme Court justices. Tell me, how many are there? There are nine. Right now there's only eight because uh, one was taken out. And I say that under, under advisement, but I say it publicly, it was taken out. You know who that was, don't you? Scalia. He was the most conservative justice on the court. And it was, uh, it was stated by one of the political parties, when he's out of the way, we'll be able to do something in this country. And Scalia died very mysteriously. They would never allow his body to be, uh, what do they call it? Um, autopsy. It never allowed an autopsy. They buried him without an autopsy. Doesn't that seem funny? Yeah. He's out on a hunting trip and, they, and, and he just dies and they don't bother to embalm him. Or they not embalm him, but they give him the, um, what is it? Autopsy. Yeah, the autopsy. That's when they cut you open and find out what kills you. They never gave Scalia an autopsy. And that's pathetic because we needed to know why that man was taken out. 
And what happened? Was it accidental or was it, was it something else? Uh, I have my thinking on that. You have yours, I'm sure. Trump has pledged to support justices and federal judges. Both are lifetime appointments who are pro-life and who are constitutionalists like Scalia, who view the intent of the Constitution as it was originally written, the originalists, and not so-called living document, uh, which changes with the whims of our culture. That's what they've called the Constitution now. They've called it a living document that has to change with the times and with the seasons. He says, no, it's not a living document. It is set as the standard for our nation. Uh, Trump has already released a list of potential Supreme Court nominees, all of whom are solidly conservative. There are 20 now that he has named, and let's head, go ahead, scrutinize them. Go ahead, study them before I put them up, so you'll know who they are. We know Hillary will appoint liberal activists who will legislate from the bench. You know the three divisions of the government, don't you? I'm getting off my study a little bit here, but I really felt an urgency on this. You know there are three branches to our government. You understand that, right? There is the executive branch, that is the president, who signs and authorizes bills that have been passed by the, by the uh, congregational, congregational, uh, congressional branch of government, the legislative branch. They're the ones that make the law, and the president signs them into law. But then there's the judicial branch, three branches of government, the judicial, the legislative, and I'm talking to you about your own government right now, and you know this stuff, but you need to remember it, and also the executive branch. Well, now, what's happened is the judicial branch has started making the laws. They're not supposed to make the laws. The legislative branch is supposed to make the laws. So now we have activist judges being appointed, liberal judges, who come in and make decisions and make and set laws in the land. It's totally out of order according to our Constitution. And then once the legislature passes a law, it goes to the president, he signs it, and it becomes law in the land. But they've absolutely turned that whole system inside out. Our Constitution is under assault. We need these new justices to be conservative and men who, and or women who believe that the, the Constitution is a set document, that it is not to be changed. Trump has already released that list. We know Hillary will appoint liberal activists. If Hillary wins, it is likely there will not be another conservative victory at the Supreme Court for the rest of our lives and perhaps for the generations because these justices serve for life. I'd love to see him change that one. The Bill of Rights itself will become under disastrous legal attack, especially the First and Second Amendments. It will be li likely be effectively the end of the American Republic as we have known it for more than two centuries. If you are uncomfortable with voting for Trump, then consider a vote for him as a vote for the Supreme Court, a vote for the unborn babies, and a vote for your own religious liberties. The future of the Supreme Court is in itself fearsome enough to vote us to vote uh, for Trump and Pence. Uh, I'm not going to any more of that. Yes, I will. <laughs> I'm going to read you a little bit more. Back to where I began. Does character matter? Yes, yes it does. But it is not the only thing that matters. Uh, I have often said that no man rises above the opinion of his children. And I am hopeful, therefore, that the unanimous and apparently very genuine options of all Donald Trump's adult children, evidenced consistently, both on stage and behind the curtain, will prove to be insightful into the character of the man. While Donald Trump is a very human being, and the possibility of deep disappointment in him is yet very real, Mr. Trump has convinced many, including me, now that he will fight for the issues which matter most. It is clear, for better or for worse, he's not afraid to fight. Now, one last individual, James Dobson. How many remember Dr. Dobson? He's the one that was behind Focus on the Family, the founder of it. This is what he spoke to. He spoke to many evangelicals recently, and he said this, and I quote, All I can tell you is that we have only two choices, Hillary or Donald. Hillary scares me to death. And if Christians stay home because Trump isn't a better candidate, Hillary will run the world for perhaps eight years. The very thought of that haunts my days and nights. One thing is sure, we need to be in prayer for our nation at this time of crisis, unquote. A recent article cast this election as even more potential, uh, as even more pot in more potential terms. This is a 9-11 Flight 93 election, take over the pulpit or die. Take over the cockpit or die. Remember the flight uh, 93? 
they were going to crash it, and the men on board took over that flight and deviated it so it didn't hit its target. They said, this 9-11 Flight 93 election is a take over the pulpit or die. That's how serious this is. Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dare we add, dear Christian, the logical conclusion in our substances, not to vote is to vote. So you can't stay home and not vote. That's a cop-out. I go, ha, ha, ha. That's not funny. Not voting. If you don't vote, you're voting for the opposition by your silence. So uh, I hope I don't step on anybody's toes tonight. But if I do, Jesus heals toes. So I don't have to worry. But I know he can heal your, your toes. That's been, I, I just... You know, it was funny, two weeks ago when I was preaching, I sat down on the seat next to Ron as the service was being concluded, and I leaned over and I said to him, did I get too political? He looked at me, he said, no, but you wanted to. <laughs> I said, yeah, man, you, you know I danced the knife blade on that one because I, I needed to come out. I need to tell my congregation the truth. I need to tell you the truth. I don't care if you're offended. I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. And let the truth settle the issue in your heart before God. So when I come to this election and I hear polls, I just keep saying, but God, but God, my father hasn't spoken yet. And when he speaks, we'll know the truth. See, it's not a matter of between a lesser or greater evil. It's between the carnal and the demonic. You have to choose. Wood is just plain carnal. So the man is carnal. So are you. So am I. If the truth be known, there's not one perfect one among us or you wouldn't be here. You would already be home with the angels. But the fact that you're still here says to me there's a little bit of carnal still in us. That's why Jesus said you don't ask your left hand what your right hand's doing. You don't tell your left hand. Your left hand is your carnal nature. It's your flesh, your stinking flesh. So your spirit man never asks your flesh, what should I do? Should I pray? You know what flesh will tell you? No, I'll have a sandwich. Right, John? The flesh will tell you, go get, go get a hero. Should I, should I read my Bible? No, go watch the news. Don't let your left hand have an opinion, your nature, your flesh, have an opinion about what God is telling you to do in the spirit. He's telling you to pray, pray. He's telling you to sing, sing. He's telling you to read the word, read the word. He's telling you to share Christ with someone. I was in the process of winning uh, Benny Diaz to the Lord out here under the portico when Vinnie Coppola came in tonight. He said, I don't want to interrupt you, bro. I said, I'm winning him to Jesus. He said, okay, go for it, Pastor. So I said, Denny, Benny, get saved, will you, tonight? So he knows I'm doing my job. So uh, Benny's saved now. He's out there. Oh, by the way, you wonder what he's building? He's building a bridge. The theme for our missions convention is the bridge that reaches the lost, all right? Something like that. So uh, you're going to have to come into the sanctuary Friday night across the bridge. So he's building a bridge. So if you uh, encourage him. When you go out there, Diane said to him, coming in, you, it, needs, it needs boards on it to walk on. He wasn't planning to do that. So she already modified it this morning on the way in. But we got Benny saved tonight. Don't be ashamed to share the gospel with anybody and everybody. You could even try to win Pastor Ron. You know, it wouldn't hurt. Practice on him. Practice on, uh, uh, practice on, uh, uh, Sister Broderick. Glenor, okay, if you want to practice your salvation track presentation, you, you practice on Glenor. Take Glenor aside and get her saved. I would really appreciate it. Get, get her saved, okay? But uh, share your faith. So I, I guess what I'm saying to you tonight is this election is so important. You cannot stay home. Please, I beg you, do not stay home. Vote. Now, don't do what I did the last election, and I told you what I did. I didn't like either of them, so I went in the voting booth and I pulled the curtain. I voted all the propositions and all the senators and judges, but the president, I didn't, I didn't throw the switch on either one. And I opened up the curtain and registered the fact I was there, but I didn't vote for either of them. I got so convicted about that, I wanted to go back and do it over again, they wouldn't let me. Uh, I, I, I just said, I'm, not gonna, I'm just not going to vote. So I went to vote and went through all of it, signed in, they know my name's on the books and everything. But I didn't vote for the president, and the Holy Spirit really spoke to me after that was over. And did you know that 38 million evangelicals and Christians did not vote in that election? 38 million who were registered to vote and could have voted didn't bother. And look what we got. Ta-da! 
So the voice of silence is not a voice that does any good at all. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a man that I revere so much uh, in our church history. He, he was strong against the government, uh, even more than Jesus was. But, and that got him hung. Adolf Hitler hung him with piano wire one week before he committed suicide. He hated Dietrich Bonhoeffer so much that he feared him in the gospel of the cross more than he, voted, than, than he feared the invading armies of Normandy. He just hated the gospel so much. So he, he killed 28 pastors that night, the night before, or week before he committed suicide. Hung them all with piano wire in the, in the uh, prison. Uh, so it decapitated all of them. But uh, Dietrich Bonhoeff went home praising the Lord and died as a martyr, but would not relent the faith. I'm encouraging you to be strong in the Lord. I don't think they're, they're hanging anybody right now. I think we could get through this election without any physical abuse. So we just need to do our job. Do our duty. Hello. Boy, is it quiet in here. I think I stepped on some toes later, but I have some anointing oil. We'll pray for you later. Now, the fact of God's sovereignty, that he is in control, should bring comfort and peace to all of us. If you're worried about the election, stop worrying. Just pray. Then go down and vote. Now, I want you to look at Psalm 75 with me for a moment. Psalm 75. Don't be lazy. Open up your Bible. Find it. We call this Bible study on Wednesday night. Can't understand how Christians can come to Bible study without a Bible. But uh, it happens all the time. But I want you to see something in 75. And why, why the election is going to be by God's choice. He's going to promote the one he wants. Now, I heard a prophetic voice say recently... It could be that God will use Trump to put her in office so that God can release judgment upon this nation. I don't believe that that has to happen that way. I believe God has good in mind for America. I don't think God's sitting on a strong waiting for the opportunity to bat us with a, bang us with a bat. I believe God wants to show mercy. He is gracious and to all that call upon him. Uh, he wants so much to give us a third awakening in this nation. We've had two in the 1800s, early 1900s. We've had two great revivals in America that spread to the world. And I believe God wants to give us a third. And why I say that is because in the mouths of two or three witnesses, let it be established. And I believe God has given us two and he wants to give us a third. He wants to give us a great awakening. Now, I, I, I know you may think I'm simple when I say this, but I believe when God makes his choice for who is to be president, it will position the church in America to have a great awakening and a great revival. I believe with all of my heart it will be a window of opportunity for us, maybe four more years before the rapture. You say, oh, no, Pastor, are you telling me Jesus is not coming for another four years? I don't know. He could come tonight. Amen? He could come at any time. But I also think that sometimes he delays for the sake of souls, not willing that any should perish. So if waiting four more years for the rapture means that your neighbors get saved, wouldn't it be worth it? If it meant that your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren got saved, wouldn't it be worth it? Wouldn't it be good for backsliders to come back to the churches that are, have drifted away? I mean, hundreds of people have been in this sanctuary and aren't going to church anywhere. Hundreds. I'm not exaggerating. If they all came back, you wouldn't find your chair on Sunday. Now, I'm praying them back. You better get here early. So I'm praying them back in and take your seat. I'm praying them back in that God would restore them. Because it, it has to happen before he comes. Now look at this verse in Psalm 75, verse 6. For promotion, now watch it carefully now. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Who is going to be president in, two, in, four, uh, in November 8th? The one of God's choosing. He is going to choose. Believe it, it's gospel. He's going to make the choice. God is the judge. Do you see that in your Bible? Verse 7. He, you need to underline this. He put it down one and setteth up another. Say that with me. He put it down one and setteth up another. Do it again. He put it down one and setteth up another. One more time. He put it down one and setteth up another. So whoever wins, and don't listen to the first results that come out of the polls uh, on the election night. Ha, 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 ha. Ah, wait till the final votes are in before you blow your cool. You know, just wait on the Lord till he has the final word. 
and when the final count comes in and the announcement is made, then you can jump up and down and begin to rejoice. In the meantime, you just stay in, in an attitude of prayer. Just hold your ground. Just say, thank you, God. I don't care what the spin doctors are saying. I don't care what the tabulations look like. I don't care what the poll numbers. It doesn't matter. But God. But God. But God. He put it down one and setteth up another. Now, look at that verse 6 for motion. What, what, what direction on the compass is missing? North. He says, promotion does not come from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. It comes from the sides of the north. Do you know what the sides of the north is? God's throne room. Come on with me to Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 48, 1 and 2. You all have heard of the aurora borealis, right? The northern lights, those beautiful shimmering blues and yellows and greens and reds and pinks that flash across the northern, he northern heavens uh, in the wintertime. You know that many Bible scholars believe that the, the aurora borealis is a little bit of the light of glory that's shining through from heaven. And God allows a little bit of what's going on behind the scene to come through. And we can see that. Beautiful. I've shared with you, I don't know how many times, I saw the aurora borealis from 38,000 feet on two separate occasions flying from the Red Eye Express from Japan back to the United States after ministry in Southeast Asia. And I sat on that side of the airplane and I remember everybody was sleeping. I opened up my, my blind on my window and I looked out at the Aurora Borealis. The beautiful shimmering northern lights looked like curtains, folds and folds of pink and blue and yellow and light green. Beautiful, breathtaking at 38,000 feet with no clouds. It was pure revelation of what was a little bit of the glory seeping out from underneath the curtains of heaven. Oh, is heaven going to be a wonderful place? Filled with glory and grace. So promotion comes from the sides of the north. Listen to this in Psalm uh, 48. I get so excited, pop off my watch. Look at verse 1. Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north the city of the great king. Where is God's throne? It's in the sides of the north. And all promotion comes from the north. Remember that. Not from the east or from the west. Promotion comes from the Lord. Why? Because uh, Psalm 75, coming back there with me again, 75, 6 and 7 says, God is the judge, he put it down one and raiseth up another. So promotion comes from the sides of the north and the God, God is judge, puts down one, sets up another. So God will determine our nature's future on November 8th. Not the Republicans, not the Democrats. God. Father. Father. He is the righteous judge. Now, you need to believe the Bible, you don't. If you want to believe CBS, ABC, C M MSNBC, Fox, any of them, you want to believe them over God? No. I'd rather believe God. I don't care what they say. The sovereignty of God may be defined as the exercise of his supremacy. In, second, in 1 Chronicles 20, verse 6, don't look there, but listen. King Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat said this. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. So November 8th is in God's hands. You need to know that when you lay your head on the pillow tonight. Don't worry about it. God's got it all under control. And when I hear the polls, I remember, you just say like your pastor, but God, God has not spoken yet. So our prayer must be, oh God, thy will be done. You choose. You choose. Let him make a choice. He sees things you and I don't see. He knows things that even WikiLeaks doesn't know about. God knows things you and I don't know about. And when all is said and done, we will be saying, Father, we rest in your sovereignty and pray for our new president whom you have chosen. Listen, God is infinitely elevated above the highest creature. He is in control. He is the most high Lord of heaven and earth, subject to no one, listen to this, influenced by no one, absolutely independent might surprise you to know that God's not Republican or, 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 or Democrat. He's independent. So God does as he pleases, only as he pleases, and always as he pleases. So no one can stop him 
or hinder him. And in his own word, he tells us that. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can stop his hand. So divine sovereignty means simply God is God. He'll always be God. He is on the throne of the universe, directing all things and working all things after the counsel of his own will. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. He knows better for you and me about your life and my life than we know for ourselves. We think we know best for our kids. And we make decisions for our kids sometimes, and we find out later that it wasn't the best decision after all. So you need to ask God to tell your son or daughter what they're supposed to be and not what you want them to be. Well, my son's going to be a doctor. Oh, really? Well, maybe God wants him to be a missionary. So who's going to win? It should be God's will over your will. Don't try to tell your kids what to be because I'll tell you, if they become what you want them to be, they'll be miserable and they'll be cursing you out for the days of the rest of your life because you forced them to do something that wasn't God's will and it wasn't really what they wanted to do. It was what mom and dad wanted. We need to put our kids on the altar. When Diane and I had three girls, we made a vow between ourselves that we would never require our girls to go to Bible school. We would never require them to go into ministry like mom and dad did. No way. Nobody needs to be in the ministry unless God called them to it. And we always kept that door open for Jennifer, Andrea, and Pam to, to go toward ministry. And, and when they did not, we didn't have any boo-hoo times and crying out, having, you know, temper tantrums before God because they, they didn't become a pastor's wife. Oh, God bless them for not being a pastor's wife. Just ask Pastor Diane. She'll tell you. Oh, God, thank you. You preserved my girls and kept them from all that Pastor Diane has gone through. Of course, God gave her a good husband. And uh, she's been blessed. She has been blessed. And, and, and I mean that. I say that humbly. But it is true. I'm signing autographs for humility later. Uh, for the child of God, we believe. We believe Father knows best. They used to have a television program. Do you remember that? Yes. Now, don't put up your hand because it'll date you. But you remember Father knows best? Well, our Heavenly Father does. He knows best and he allows, listen to me, he allows disappointments. He allows setbacks to come across our path. He allows our kids to go through things. We're watching our daughters, uh, you know, go through things. And, uh, oh, I've got to get a higher stool here. Goodness gracious. Oh, got too much to put on this stool, brother. <laughs> Need a bigger seat or a smaller cheek, one or the other. <laughs> go ahead, John. You can laugh. It's okay. But, but, <laughs> I know, I know, uh, I know. I've watched you walk out of the church, I know. But you know, disappointments come, setbacks come. We watch what our girls are going through. And sometimes I would do anything, and I say to the Lord, Lord, if I could take it for them, I would. But I, I can't. And they come through it, and they find out God is faithful on their own. And they'll have to lean on mom and dad, because we're not always going to be here. They better learn how to pray before we leave. They better get their faith in God up to date and trust him for their, his promises before we leave. Because we're leaving here. Not, not tonight. I don't think tomorrow. But whenever, we're going we're gonna to leave. And our kids are going to be on their own. But you know what? We have done what we were supposed to do with our girls. I know we raised them right. You know how I can tell? I see it in my three granddaughters. Jennifer's three daughters. So far, just one daughter is, you know, doing her job but yeah uh, the, the, the others are coming but I look at our granddaughters I look at our granddaughters and at dinner time around the table we always hold hands and the girls pray How, what do they say God is great God is good and we thank him for our food by his hand must all be fed get it as Lord our daily bread and then they go, Amen. <laughs> and I tell you, we go to the restaurants. We have our girls lead out in prayer. You'd be amazed that people that come over to us and say afterward, I couldn't believe what I just saw. The girls know how to pray. The granddaughters. See, the test of your parenting will be how your grandchildren turn out. <laughs> come on. All right. Uh, uh, he, he, see, he allows disappointments. He allows things to happen, even in their lives, like you'd like to protect them from it. Then he overrules those events at the right time and sanctifies them to protect us and promote us and keep us and provide for us. That's why that old song, Trust and Obey. 
but I, I no look out and I see a young lady like this who grew up in our church, and I say, God, you've been so good. Our children are now raising their children to serve the Lord. So her daughter comes in here, and she loves Jesus. What's her name again? Miranda. Miranda. Hi, Miranda. How are you, honey? Do you know Jesus loves you? Hey, praise you, Jesus. See, no, we know we did our job with Christina because here's, here's her little one coming back to worship the Lord. It's good to see Dolores back in the sanctuary tonight. God bless your heart. We miss you. Like a social worker giving out alms and dispensing his blessings. And they will allow him to sustain the earth or light the lamps of heaven or rule the waves of the ever-moving oceans. But when God ascends his throne, his creation begins to grind its teeth and begins to curse him. They don't want God on his throne. But we, who embrace the sovereignty of God and proclaim the enthroned God, and we understand it, that it is his right to do with his own as he wills, we have no problem with this doctrine. We rejoice in it. It is in great security for us. Men turn a deaf ear to God and will turn a deaf ear to us when we talk about the sovereignty of God, God on his throne. But he is not the God they love. He is the God we love. And so we can enthrone Father and say, Father, you take control of my life. You know where I'm working. If you want me to stay here, I'll stay here. If you want to promote me, I'll, I'll, you promote me in your time. But don't run ahead of him. Let God make the decisions. Let him open and close the door as he wills. Uh, when you pray for your son-in-law and daughter-in-law that are yet to come, don't tell God what she's supposed to look like or what he's supposed to be looking like. You just say, God, bring the right man. God, bring the right woman to my daughter, my son. You bring the one of your choosing. Maybe he won't be working for the Mets. Maybe he won't be a superstar. Maybe he'll just be a clean living, straight living man that loves his wife and takes care of his family. You're blessed. You're blessed. It's going to take God to find a man worth marrying today, ladies. And it's going to take God to find the right woman, you young men who aren't married yet. And you're waiting. Where is she? Don't you be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. God gave you Paul. Paul Mejia. I went and changed your last name, Christina. He's a good man. And you're a blessed woman. God's given you a beautiful family. But it was by God's choice. Uh, and so, so tonight, to kind of cap what I've been saying to you, we love to preach God on his throne. We love to preach him enthroned. Because he is God, the God we trust and love. And we declare that he is God alone. The imperial potentate, unrivaled in majesty, unlimited in power, unaffected by anything outside himself. Well, I, I'll quit there. I've got enough notes to go on for another 45 minutes, but I, I won't tonight. I'll, I'll go easy because I know you can't endure more than your seat can take. So um, I, I know that sometimes you get enough. The Bible study doesn't have to go on for eternity. Uh, it's enough when we've had enough and I'm, I'm done. Amen. So. Father, we just thank you tonight that you are sovereign, that you sit high and your eye is ever upon us, as you're always mindful of the sparrow that falls in the field. You're also mindful, Lord, to feed the squirrels as the acorns are falling from the trees in incredible bounty this year. Thank you that you provide for the birds and the squirrels and, and all the other creatures that you've created. And thank you that you take care of us. Everything we need, your hand provides. When we lay our head on the pillow tonight, we can go to sleep and know you have it all under control. Your angels will guard us through the night and protect us with the rise of a new day. We thank you that, Lord, the days, weeks, and months of our lives that are passing so swiftly are under your watchful eye at all times. You know where we are, you know where we're going, and you know how to get us from where we are to where you want us to be. So we ask tonight that you would give us a faith in you that doesn't listen to the spin doctors on the news, that doesn't worry about the headlines in the newspaper, but a confidence in God that says, Father, you put one up and you put another down. For all promotion comes from the sides of the north, even from your throne. So, Lord, we ask for the election tonight, that even now that you would prepare the hearts of the electorate across America, that, Lord, they would not be influenced by unjust politics or there'd be no criminal action in our voting booths. We ask you to preserve and protect the integrity of this election. We ask you, Lord, that you shut down everything that's in play that would be corrupt, that would be distracting, that would be threatening. Father, shut it down, I pray, in the name of Jesus. 
and remove every voice that should not be speaking to your people. Call the electorate at night when there's nobody, nobody calling for their attention. Talk to them at night. Talk to those Christians who are even seated here tonight who have no plan to vote. My God, would you convict us that we are, we are looking at, at the, the very sanctity of life. We're looking at the Supreme Courts. We're looking at our freedoms and recognizing this vote could be the last vote we ever have in America. And it will be the most important. So we ask you, would you choose? Lord, would you choose who is to be president? Would you choose, please? Because we can't trust our emotions. And we, and we vacillate so much, but we want the truth to prevail. So bless that one that you have chosen. Make the way clear through the electoral college. There'd be no deception, no manipulation. Nobody get bought off or paid off. It'll all come to the light. And Father, I ask this tonight in Jesus' name, confident that you will do what we're asking you to do in Jesus' name. Amen.